Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Aurum podcast, where we discuss and we talk all about building winning teams. I'm your host. My name is Tony Curry, and I'm so glad that you could join with us. With me today on this Easter Saturday, this Easter weekend, I have with us the experts in the HR field who have come to help us be able to deconstruct uh, and simplify difficult issues regarding the workplace. And they are right here with us. Uh, let me start with our consultant, the consultant for consultants. Uh, I like using that term. Uh, Martha Tuku. Welcome, Martha. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anthony. Good morning, viewers from wherever you are listening to us. Please let us have a constructive discussion this morning. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Martha. Uh, one of the, the key person here has disappeared a bit, but she's right here. The, CEO, the MD or the CEO of Aurum Consultants Limited. Uh, Zipora Korea. Welcome, Zipi. Thank you, Anthony. Good morning, viewers. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you're watching us from. Thank you for joining us this morning, and we are looking forward to having a productive discussion. Thank you, Zipi. And finally, but never the least, most most definitely never the least, is our own manager within our own consultants, my good friend Alex Isoe. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Uh, I thank God because it's an opportunity that we have to discuss these matters concerning the contracts, alteration. Welcome, viewers, and let us have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Indeed, we are going to have a discussion regarding certain issues regarding employment. But before that, let me introduce our consultants, the hosts of this particular podcast. Aurum Consultants is a HR and risk advisory consultancy based here in Nairobi, where we help uh, businesses, we help businesses of every stripe and every kind to build winning teams, specifically regarding their people management. As Alex has alluded, we have been discussing issues regarding contracts. Last week, we began by discussing why should you issue contracts when hiring staff. So today we are still continuing on the theme of contracts, but we want to talk about uh, the issuance and alterations of contracts. Issuance and alterations of contracts. Now, before I continue with this discussion of issuance and alterations, last week, we had a very fruitful discussion and uh, we had uh, interaction with our audience and somebody at the very, very, very end said a question that we were not able to tackle at that time. And we said we will tackle it today. Uh, so uh, if you could be put up the screen, we had a question, uh, the, a lady called Flora, Flora Haleli had asked, what can you do as a HR? as a HR professional, in a situation where a head of department hired somebody but forgot to have the new staff signing uh, a contract with KPIs, you know, key performance indicators, especially now, later, if the staff needs to be terminated on poor performance. So if I get this question straight, is a HOD has hired somebody but forgot to give that new person they have hired a contract that stipulates the KPIs. And now, after a while, we have decided to terminate the contract based on poor performance. But remember that the staff never signed a contract showing what are the deliverables. Zippy and uh, Alex and uh, Martha, comments fupi fupi. Just, you know, spice that answer with just a few comments before we go to the main dish. Ziti, let me start with you. What's your, uh, what's your view? Just, just briefly, what's your view regarding that question? 
Uh, Tony, I'm not so sure how to answer this question briefly because this is a very wide kind of discussion because right. a lot of employers find themselves in these kind of challenges. But of course, they can always reach out to us for us to be able to support them. But when I'm looking at this question, it kind of points out to a situation where probably the contract, uh, you know, was not signed. And mm. it makes me wonder for this particular organization, you know, whether they are clear, uh, there's a clear understanding the responsibilities of the HR and the HOD, because when you say the HOD forgot, then mm -hmm. where do we leave the HR? Because as the HR, you are the custodian of contracts and all these KPIs, and it's your responsibility to make sure actually these documents are in place. So here's a scenario where we are actually finding out that this uh, documentation is not in place too late. And what I would actually respond to this is we must go back to the basics, because when you want to terminate on an issue of poor performance, what are you going to base it on? When you're telling an employee mm -hmm. they have not been performing, yet they don't have the KPIs or the contract is not in place, how, how are you actually coming up with that conclusion? Is it an assumption mm -hmm. that this person is not performing? Because if there's nothing to guide and to help the employee understand what they're supposed to be doing, and you can be able to measure that against what they've done, then to be very honest, I think we can't come back and start telling the employee they are not performing. And I would say we need to go back to the basics and put the documentation in place because if the documentation is not placed, you can't terminate, and especially on poor performance. And I think when we were talking last week, uh, I did mention um, poor performance has become one of the litigious areas of employment. So before you tell someone you are performing poorly, have we given the necessary documents? Does the employee understand? Have we evaluated them and given them feedback you're not performing and that you need to do one, two, three before we can get to that place? And even in, a, in, issue, in an issue of poor performance, you have to go through a very long process of putting someone through PIP. You have to put them through a disciplinary process before you can end up terminating. So I would say go back to the basics, put the documentation in place and start the process again. As an employer, unfortunately, you have to pay the price for not putting the necessary documentation in place. And, and I think that will be my take on this question. Maybe Anna, uh, maybe uh, Martha and Alex mm -hmm. can uh, give their input as well. Right. Let me just say, Zippy, Zippy, you have been very clear. And what I can say that should this, should you terminate this person and they take you to court, my only input in this, because I support everything Zippy has said, is that the court does not listen to the 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 things you are saying. The court works with the process. So the process of hiring, so they want to see that contract uh, and the process of terminating. So in, in that process, they will need to see the employment contract, which now someone somewhere forgot to, to sign. That's a very expensive forgetting uh, for the employer because it's your employee who forgot to give this person the contract. So really, the onus is on you. Uh, the other thing you have to show the the process of coming up to the up to the point you have said this person is not performing. It is so important to give like some performance appraisals in writing and the feedback that has been going on between you and this performing and performing staff. For you to come to reach that decision, let there be documentation that has gone between the HOD and the employee, and now they have come to a conclusion that they are not performing. Uh, so I want you to know that the court works with the process. So if this person, you terminate them and they sue you, you will need to, to prove that you have done due diligence. As he has said, have you done everything to ensure that they perform the PIP uh, performance improvement plan? And what are the targets you gave during that time of the performance improvement plan? And how did they perform them? All those things need to be in writing because should this case go to court, those are the documentations you are going to present. Otherwise, this is your responsibility. Whatever is going on, I'm not sure I could advise that you terminate this person for now. I'm thinking that you start with the basics, like Zippy said, have the contract signed, do the performance 
uh, appraisals, evaluations in writing, have a PIP, give some specific goals to be achieved, like within a certain period of time. And if it's not done, then you're able to evaluate that and you can say, surely it's time for us to disengage. But without that, I'm sure, I'm so sorry you cannot terminate this person. Thank you. Wow. It's getting okay. more and more interesting. Alex, tell us your point of view. Okay. Uh, in um, agreeing with what uh, my federal colleagues have said, I want to say three things. One, this form of engagement is what we call um, implied engagement. Um, implied engagement, it means these things are not put in, write in writing. And then this is now the scenarios. Two, I want to see where is the function of HR? Who is responsible for the recruitment processes as well as the termination process? Because he should guide here and also is in charge of is in charge of documentation. So they cannot execute the process of termination without having a contract signed and the JD that guides these KBIs. So that is where now the HR come in to assist. The last issue I can talk about is um when we are terminating the process is very key because all the stages must be followed so there is no basis this employee will be terminated based on poor performance yet there is no ground of documentation that can ascertain this happened so it is good as um, spur and um, mother have said that we must go back to the basis and um and streamline the process. Thank you. Wow, to our viewers and listeners, especially to Flora and anyone else asking this kind of technical question, you have heard for yourself. You've heard for yourself, and that is why you need, as Alex has described, you need to have your processes in place. And if you are there out there listening to us, you're running your, your, your business. Zippy, you have something to, to add. Can you add before I continue? You know, Tony, this uh, makes me uh, think about, uh, you know, the things that organizations need to do. And I think if you go back to our podcast previously, we've talked about, for example, things like uh, risk audits. We've talked about uh, HR audits. Mm -hmm. You know, I think as HR, we need to start embracing some of these practices because we'll be able to catch on some of these uh, issues where we are actually auditing our own processes to see are we following them the people we work with because hr does not work in isolation hr works with hod's where you expect the hod's to align themselves in certain processes are they aligning themselves and are we having any gaps you need to check your gaps in terms of your contracting how are you contracting when people are, are on probation how are you putting them on probation what is the period and during that period what must happen so I think it's also an issue of, you know, understanding our own processes and going back to auditing them and making sure we're implementing the same. But I think that's another conversation altogether. And I would encourage Flora, if you have any challenges, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to support you or any other employer probably going through these challenges. Wonderful. Thank you, Zippy. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Martha. That is something that if you're out there, you're running your business, you're a HR professional, you're an entrepreneur, you know, you're, you know, you're a decision maker in your company and, uh, and you're probably looking and wondering, okay, that is very interesting because issues happen. We've been having gaps, you know, we've been threatened to be sued. Kindly get in touch with us here at Aram Consultants. We can help you deal with such issues that come up uh, that you are unable to, you know, to sort out. Now, jumping into our discussion today. Today we are talking about contract issuance and alterations. And now you've heard, probably you're wondering, okay, uh, you guys have just spoken something that sounds like, like you know, what, what's going on? Now, if you're a business owner or a leader seeking insights on how to effectively navigate the complexities of this uh, co uh, cont contract, 
then here today we want to discuss about how uh, to discuss and explore the nuances of crafting, crafting solid agreements, adapting them to changing circumstances, and ensuring that they serve your business's best interests. So let's right, jump right into it and ask, I'll start this with Zippy. Somebody may look and ask me, uh, I may look at us and say, okay, we are talking about issuer, issuering, issu, issuance of contracts and how to alter them. So first and foremost, what is a contract alteration? Somebody may ask me from a HR perspective, what is a contract alteration? Zippy, you can um, tackle this first. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Thank you for that question. And you know, contract alterations are things that we are finding ourselves more often than not at the workplace uh, having to deal with. And I think when you're looking at uh, contract alterations, you are probably looking at amending an already existing contract. And basically, just to give a bit of a background, this is a, a typically, you know, a change you're making to a contract that is already in existence. Uh, probably you have agreed on uh, the terms of engagement. Maybe it's a contract that was supposed to be for six months or one year, and now you need to extend this contract maybe with another one or two months you know uh or maybe it's changes in terms of the deliverables that need to happen and sometimes you might find you might need to do an addendum you know that would clarify things if you're making any changes to an existing contract and of course a lot of times when you're looking at uh, these amendments uh when it's to the benefit of the employee you will not find much of a challenge the challenge comes in when actually that change in that contract is to the disadvantage of the employee and that's why we start looking at it from the point of law. What does the law say when it comes to contract uh, alterations? And like I say, you know, it occurs when a single party or both parties, you know, decide to modify an existing contract or, or the terms of that engagement. And the key is, you know, the parties must agree. You cannot um, alter a contract as an employer just because you have decided you are the decision maker and you can change the contract anyway you can do that the law does not allow you to do that both parties must discuss must be in agreement to any alteration that would be meant to that contract now key to note is that as an employer you must make sure such discussion is documented you can't uh, just have a conversation on the corridors or what you call the sweet conversation, then go and alter the contract and call the employer and say, come and sign here. You must document, you must make sure there are minutes that are actually documented and signed by both parties that are involved. If possible, don't just be the two of you, make sure again, there are weaknesses of the other people involved in the process. That way you ensure there's a clear cordial conversation, there's understanding and both parties understand why we are making this alteration. So I think to just start us off, I think uh, that those are some of the things we need to be aware of as we start looking at contract alterations. Back to you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Zippy. You have set the ball rolling. Let me go to Alex now. Uh, Alex, uh, you, are, you, are, you are the one at the, what do you call it? At the, at the action end. Yeah, You wear the gloves and hold the tools and She's allowed issues at what you call it at the sharp end of, of, of uh, the HR practice. Kindly let us know briefly what's your take regarding uh, contract alteration? Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Tony. Yeah. Uh, contract alteration, uh, let me start from the two types. The two types of this alteration one is bilateral alteration. Mm -hmm. which is made between the two parties having the consent on various terms to be changed. Unilateral, this is where one party has the rights to change or to amend the contract. All these are based on various circumstances. For instance, at what point um, shall we have unilateral alteration to the contract? Mm. One I can give more specific is the change of the product of that company, all the services that the company has been doing 
now it has decided to change to a different uh, productivities. That one can make the, the employer to unilaterally change the contract. Hmm. Um, when we are talking issues to do with um, bilateral contract reiteration, whereby the two, that is the employer and the employee, have to agree. It is, for example, in the something to do with payment, because initially if we had agreed this is amount that you should be given and it was uh, recorded in the contract but in the process the responsibility and other changes comes in whereby now the employee the employee and the employer have to sit down agree on changing or reviewing that salary that is just to give an example on the circumstances where these two types of uh, contract declaration comes in, and that is my take. Okay, thank you, thank you, Alex. As usual, we can always count on you to give us a well thought out answer. Martha, being having worked in this industry for a while, and I'm sure you've dealt with this from the banking sector to the NGO sector, you have been there, done that. What's your take regarding? what is uh, what would call a contract alteration as thanks tony and as zp and alex have uh, nicely put it a contract alteration occurs after a contract has been signed but one party um and for for employment purposes you will find is the employer who seeks to to modify the terms of, of, of employment or key points in the contract. Uh, so having worked in the bank and in the NGO, you'll find there are various reasons why this happens. But then you'll find when it's for a positive, uh, positive reason for, for this change, and when I say positive, it, it would include promotion, it includes salary increment. Uh, you can, yeah, such things. It's so welcome. So even if the employer just does it, you'll find there will be no noise uh, in the organization. <laughs> it, it, is. It, it is a challenge where now it's changing things uh, negatively. And, and that's why ZP said there has to be discussion. We saw it during COVID. So many organizations kind of wound up or they downsized. And then downsizing, meaning some of them actually took half salaries. For you to change my salary to half, we have to have a discussion and I have to agree to it. Yes. Because they were doing it for the survival of the organization. And so, hey, or right now we are like this. So between now and, and, and such and such a time, we either close down or we take half salaries and we work towards rebuilding our organization. So should we all agree to that? It is so important to ensure that is documented. Mm. So it will not just be said in a discussion, it's also documented. Mm. Uh, and anything else that is negative in that in a contract, I don't know whether demotions happen, but if they do, it has to be an agreement and the reason must be very clear why this has happened and both parties are in agreement. That's what I'll, I'll just say as a highlight for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Indeed, indeed, there you have shown us your experience in, uh, you know, just clarity that indeed alterations do happen. Then most of the time if I'm the employee and my employee is altering my my contract to my benefit, you know, my salary is being increased, my job promotion, and you know, getting a promotion, you know, is this now moving up higher? No problem, no problem. Take the initiative, Mr. Employer. I welcome the change. But now if it is reverse, my salary is being shrunk. My position is going in reverse gear. Uh, and you do it without my, you know, now it becomes an issue. So indeed, Thank you, thank you, thank you, ladies, for bringing in that. 
Now, let me hit now the second point. Uh, I don't know whether it means the same, but let me now bring a twist. And Martha, I'll, I'll come to you again. Uh, let me start with you. Okay, we have discussed what is a, a contract alteration. Now, the second question which probably your viewers would ask us is, can an employment contract be altered? I know, Mother, you've just hinted about it just now when you are explaining, but kindly, because you have not yet lost your trail of thought, uh, just continue explaining a bit. Can an, can an employment contract be altered now that you've given the scenario like what happened during the COVID times? Can it be helpful for our listeners understand that a bit further? Thanks, Tony. And yes, and it happens all the time. A contract mm -hmm. can be altered for, mm -hmm. and as I said, it's for various reasons. Some are positive and some are negative. The, mm -hmm. the, the underlying factor here is that at every point of alteration, the teams are in sync. You mm -hmm. can't... Uh, you can't employ me today as a HR manager or a mm. HR director. And then you say, hmm? tomorrow you say, ah, she doesn't, she doesn't look like a director. Let's change that contract to a manager. That mm. can never happen. <laughs> the discussions must, must have happened until when the contract was issued. And that's mm. why I say it for positive reasons, it's still okay to discuss, but you'll find, you, even if you implement, like, I've, I've worked in organizations where every year there is some form of salary increment. That is going mm. to change the initial contract. So there must be a paletta, uh, just even if it's one paragraph saying your salary has changed from A to B, mm. uh, with effect from this time, uh, and if if reporting lines have changed and you 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 will now be reporting to so and so, and then down there you put all other terms and conditions of your existing employment contract remain remain. So yes. those those small letters for altering the contracts are important yes. because the, the once you do that this small letter this is the letter you send to to the people processing the payroll, that Martha's mm. salary has moved from point A to B. If you add me an allowance, then it still has to be in writing. And so, mm -hmm. and those letters are signed. Even the person who has received, Martha who has received the increment needs to sign, and that letter is filed in her file. Mm. So, and that, whatever is in the file must correspond to what in the payroll. Now, mm -hmm. if what if it's flip side? And that's why we are saying there must be reasons and discussions and both parties must agree. Mostly, if the employer does that, it will not be taken lightly um, and it's not gonna be good. So yes, contracts can be altered, but through discussions uh, and both parties must agree on every alteration that is made to an existing employment contract. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Martha, for that. Alex, do you concur with what Martha has just said? Uh, thank you, uh, Tony. Yes, I do. On my addition to what our late mother said, is that uh, contract reiteration can happen even outside the party agreement. For instance, um, there are some situations that can um, directly make the uh, employment contract to be altered. Mm. To give an example, is the law passed, for example, that um, validate, invalidates the contract and you need to alter that contract to be in line with that law. Another situation you get um, is that give the charge as ordered the change order to the contract based on the cases that they have had and then they feel it fit 
for employment fraternity to halter changes to the contract on various uncertain terms. That is why we are saying that um, the contract alteration becomes legal. Anything signed between the two parties, it is legal binding, it is legally binding. So that is the example to me I can give or the addition I can give to Saja uh, why, why employment contract should be altered all can be altered. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Indeed, you're bringing in a different perspective to it. Zippy, from your perspective, I can see your time is really going, but tell us, what do you think about these alterations? Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Mother and Alex. I think you have uh, brought in very good points on contract alterations. Let me start by saying that uh, it's important for, and especially to employees, because a lot of times a contract alterations tend to affect the employee and sometimes maybe in a negative way. It's important for us to actually be aware the employer actually has a right to alter a contract based on their business needs. And just like Mala said, it's actually legal to alter a contract. But how, the question becomes then, how can you alter this contract? When you look at the Employment Act, uh, Chapter 10, Section 5, it actually uh, does talk about uh, contract alteration. And it states that where a matter stipulated in Section 1 uh, changes, uh, then the employer shall, in consultation with the employee, revise the contract to reflect the change and notify the employee of the change and in writing. And I think Mother has alluded to that. So yes, they, actually the law does allow the employer to alter a contract, but it's conditional. There must be consultation. It must be in writing. It must be given to the employee in writing. Remember what I said earlier, um, that when you consult with the employee, don't just consult and just tell them, but make sure there's a conversation, they understand the reason behind the altering of this contract. Why are we changing it? Because if they don't understand, then we start having another situation where the employee does not consent. And what do you do when the employee refuses to consent? And that, that's another conversation altogether. So it's your responsibility as employer to make the employee understand why we are making these changes to the original contract, because the law requires you to consult and the law requires you to put it in writing. Now, when a decision is made in consultation with the employee, then it becomes valid. In the flip side, if the decision is made without consultation, then that change becomes null and void. And what happens if there's a litigation issue? The court uh, will actually go to the original uh, contract, which is what is a valid document. So very key for us to understand the law, yes, does allow us, but you must also, from a human perspective, bring the employee to a place of understanding. Why are we making these changes? What does it mean for me in terms of, you know, my current employment and my current terms? Is it going to affect my salary? Is it going to affect other benefits? What is the impact of this? Sometimes the changes probably mean I'm being given extra responsibilities. Now, when an employee is given extra responsibilities, sometimes the expectation is they will it will come with uh, benefits. It will come with the money. But sometimes that is not always the case uh, because you might make those changes, and especially for growing businesses where, you know, we consult with, where you find it's an SME, they are growing, the business is growing, and as a business is growing, probably there's need to change the roles. Um, then what happens if the money is not available for you to be able to remunerate? These are discussions that must happen with the employee and again put in writing, because once you put it in writing, then it becomes legal. When it's not in writing, then it becomes what mother was saying, you know, it's yes, it's those stories you are talking about on the streets and it does not hold water at the end of the day so consultation uh, that is agreeable when there's consultation then the document becomes valid when there's no consultation then it's null and void and i think that will be my take so again refer to the employment act because it does actually cover the issues of contract alteration okay okay on this <laughs> i don't know where you are whether it is cold and crisp like it is where I am, but our conversation is pretty warm. I'm sure if you're out there listening to us and you have a question or you have a comment, don't fear, throw them. Even if we are off, we are off offline, throw them in. As we did earlier as we were beginning 
we will always uh, highlight the questions and attempt to answer them. But now our time is really gone. We have just a few more minutes to go. I can see Alex, you're saying you want to add something. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Tony. Um, there is this concept, all practices that are happens in the uh, working environment, yes. implied contracts. Mm. Can we alter implied contracts? <laughs> to my Good case, yeah. to my case, I ask a question maybe to answer so the, the, the same. Yes, we can alter this, but it must now come in writing because that alteration, for instance, give it is for five year addition. We must now do that in writing. In the, uh, imbrica the, the, the imbricity comes to an end and this becomes express contract. That's my mm. take. That's what I wanted to add on that. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That aspect of imply, can you alter? I, I found that is uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, Zipi, I can see you are saying, I think employers need to stop using oral and implied contracts. Indeed, you need to do so. To you employers who are out there, you are running your business, it is very disadvantageous to you. And if you want to know how to do it, as I said earlier, reach out to us. We will be able to help you when it comes to issues of this regard. I have a final question. I know that I had a few others, but let me ask this uh, final question. What are some of the reasons for altering a contract? I know we had talked about it here and there. Let me ask Martha to, to give us uh, you know, uh, her perspective. What could be some of the reasons <laughs> that you know, you'd want to alter contract. I know you had discussed issues, for example, what happened during the COVID season, but kindly help our audience, those listening and watching us, probably understand why would you want to alter contract, either especially because it's employers who really do the alteration. Kindly help us understand that matter from your perspective. Thanks, Tony. So the straightforward ones would be uh, for the organizations that have periodic salary reviews. Mm. Uh, there are some organizations who actually work with, uh, what is it called? It is cost of living adjustments. And you find mm. there are some organizations who would want to adjust their staff salaries every year. That will be an alteration to the contract. And that needs to appear, as I said, in a, in a separate letter. And ensuring mm. that down there you, is, you you still put a clause at all other terms of that contract remain. Um, so there's, there's, there's that salary increment bit. Then there could be, you know, like when, when an organization is rebranding. So you find they rebrand and they change titles. Those titles come even change with the reporting lines. That also needs that will be an alteration because then if uh, you are being called, uh, let's say, HR officer, and then now we have rebranded and now we, we have moved our positions to people and culture, you know, so that title changes because this is the dynamics in the changes in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the world. So if my contract title has changed, it needs to change from from the initial employment contract that talked about HR manager or something like that. Then um, mm. the other thing that can change is yeah. So when you are rebranding, you'll find titles in the organization changes. Uh, if you are getting a promotion, then there is your mm. new title. A promotion comes with new salary. And a promotion comes with maybe a new manager, uh, an aligned manager. So that also can affect the, the changes. The, 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 the flip side of, 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 of altering a contract is where I said, if the organization wants to survive, it may not be able to, to service the, the current um, current bills that we are we are we are we are using we are doing so once we have an agreement with the staff that for the survival of these organizations we may need to take some salary cut 
and mm. this will be for a period of time and so like zp said there has to be a discussion and the good thing with these discussions the minutes must be taken and they are filed and everyone signs those minutes if mm. it's not that then they are like the ceo may need to put an email to all staff that following our meeting this is what we agreed that goes in file and then the because the 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 the, the remuneration is going to change the downwards then there needs to be a, a letter in each and every employee staff saying we are changing your salary to this and this letter there has the 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 employee must sign acknowledge receipt and put a date name and signature that mm. they have agreed to those down uh, flip side changes other things mm. that make a contract be, be be altered is like the ones alex alluded that there is a change in government that may may need a clause in the contract to be changed so all these things uh and i'll leave uh zp and alex to add others are uh, what in my mind i think we normally would have when we are when we are altering contracts remember as we alter these contracts the employee who is going to be affected is in it and they must sign the final letter that small letter you're going to issue they must sign and you put it in fine so that it, it it acts as evidence that this employee is aware uh, of what is happening some of these things of course affect the payroll and that is a letter you will also submit to the payroll so that they can make the changes necessary thank you okay thank you martha alex what's your take uh, regarding some of the reasons that all contracts are altered thank you tony just to add on top of what um mother uh, said one uh the reasons for contract reiteration, one is uh, to shorten or to extend the duration of the contract. If that has been reached by the management, it can reach to a reiteration. Two, it is when the, you wanted to alter the quantity or the price of items covered under the contract. The item in a sense that what was covered in the contract they are not reflecting the specific uh, components that are supposed to be there. So mm. if that realization has come to the, to, to, to the mind of the management, they feel it is good for the employees to know such um, components, then those items must reflect as you alter the contract. Another thing, this, these things we talk about goodies, when uh, you want to add or subtract as well things that are all types of goods that are, are in the contract. Goods, and in a sense, um, you are changing the title of uh, a certain uh, position, as Martha said. It must reflect clearly. Initially, this was the title of this position, and now we have changed this like, title to this uh, uh, other position. Others I had mentioned, but let me just also allude to it. It is when um, there is a dispute that has been solved, uh, dis uh, solved under the law, and then it makes that we have to change the contract. And uh, lastly, from my take, is uh, the calamities, like the COVID-19, when it comes and um, the, the institution, you know, the company is not able to generate income that will pay the employees, then we have to alter the contract. Thank mm. you. Okay. Zippy, you can wrap it up for us as you tell us your perspective of why we, what are some of the reasons that contracts are altered? Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I think Martha and Alex have covered that uh, pretty well. And there are many reasons uh, contracts can be altered. Uh, some, like, uh, you know, they've talked about, you know, the government directives. You know, when I look back at uh, 2020, I think there was a lot of uh, things that have happened soon after, you know, COVID started going down because we started seeing a lot of contract alterations. Why? Because uh, while before people used to be given, you know, permanent and open contracts, 
we are starting to see that actually trend changing because the government gives a directive, close this industry. So what do you do with your employees? You know, you've been told to close your business indefinitely. But just know that there are many, many other reasons like Mother and Alex have shared. But I think I want to probably twist this a little bit where, you know, we are looking at contract alterations because a lot of times you will find the initiation of a contract alteration comes from the management. Now, it's very important as directors, as CEOs, as, you know, senior executives, don't make unilateral decisions. Don't make a decision up there and come tell HR, we want you to make this change and HR, you just go ahead and write a letter altering a contract. It's very important to make the process very involving. Involve HR throughout the process. Make sure the employees involved through the process. Make sure they understand why we are doing this contract alteration. And it's not just being done for the sake of doing it. They need to understand the reasons behind it. Because employees are very understanding. If employees understand, then they will actually be agreeable. The challenge comes in when they don't understand at all. And especially if it's going to work against them especially if they are going to lose benefits. I, I remember a situation I handled where, you know, we were altering an employee's contract. And it was a very interesting scenario because all of a sudden, you know, the management, you know, felt this employee has grown the, through the ladders and they were earning a lot of money and they are probably not matching it to the job they are doing. And, you know, here they are questioning the earnings vis-a-vis -vis what the employee's production is. And that conversation started happening. And it was interesting because before I realized this is what was happening, they were going ahead and implementing and I was caught in between and I said, hey, hey, wait a minute, you cannot do this. You have to have a very involving process. And thank God they listened, you know, and we went through a whole process of, you know, making, you know, the alterations, but in agreement with the employee. And I remember the employee coming to me and saying, I would rather resign, you know, uh, I would rather not go through this process. But again, as, also, and as the HR, you also have a responsibility. If you understand probably the reasons behind this, and the employee is probably going to lose the employment because they are feeling and being unfairly treated, and they have nothing else to do, then you also have a role in mentoring and coaching. And this is why sometimes we do counseling when we are doing HR. You also have to help the employee understand then what should be my, my stepping blocks? How should I handle this? How do I accept these terms, you know? And the interesting part of that particular scenario because this employee, you know, the contract terms were changed, but they ended up being, being given commissions and all this. They actually, in a span of one year, they ended up earning way more than what they were earning before. I remember previously, you know, the situation where we were at, they were at a place where they were feeling, this is unfair, I don't want to do this, I want to quit. But because, you know, we had conversations and I helped them understand and see the tomorrow, they ended up becoming the biggest beneficiaries. So again, very important as a nature to play your role and make sure you understand where the management is coming from and make sure you also under, make sure the employee understands. But speaking to the executives, please don't make decisions and leave out HR because this is where we go wrong. We make decisions, we leave out HR, and when things start going south and we have a legal litigation, then what happens? All of a sudden, HR is brought to the picture and HR has to deal with the mess. Yes, this can be so... Um, <coughs> you know, can be prevented by making sure the process is being followed. It takes me back to the question that was being asked earlier, you know, about uh, the performance issue, where, you know, we are feeling this employee is not performing, you know, and we want to fire them. Again, leaving out HR completely and fire. Then what happens when there's a litigation, HR has to come to the picture and resolve the issue. So very important for the process to be involved. And I think that's my take, Anthony. Okay, wow. Today has been pretty intense. And that's why I say it is pretty hot in here. Well, out there, uh, it's a bit cold, it's a bit rainy, it's a bit drizzly. But I believe if you are our listener and you've been listening to us, you've been watching us, and uh, you think, wow, I think I need to hear more about this, we are available on social media handles, on uh, Facebook, on uh, YouTube, on LinkedIn. You can get in touch with us via our website, www.outofconsultants.co.ke. You can get in touch also with us via our telephone contacts and uh, email contacts at the bottom of your screen. The, part, the key here is for, for you, if you're an employer and you're a decision maker, you are a HR, and you're thinking what you guys have just discussed, these are issues that I've been facing. 
these are issues that uh, currently I'm grappling or I've seen grapple and uh, I'd like to know how to navigate through it to avoid issues. Reach out to us. We will be able to assist you. I'd like to appreciate uh, uh, Zippy. Thank you for your, for your comments. Thank you for your input. Martha, as usual, we truly appreciate your insights. Alex, you've brought very valuable insights the last two weekends last weekend and today giving us both a practical and a theoretical anchoring regarding uh, uh regarding contracts next week we'll be right here we'll have a, a a slight twist to this conversation regarding contracts a very wide discussion we could do it for even for two months but next week we'll just bring a slightly different variation of uh, the, 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 the discussion. If you, as our viewer and listener, you have a question or you'd like us to have a topic to discuss regarding contracts or anything else regarding the workplace and people management, kindly write to us, text us, even on this show after it's closed, you can simply write on it on you know the YouTube link or in the Facebook link uh, and we will be glad to be able to respond accordingly. Having said that, thank you for taking time uh, this Easter weekend to be with us. We appreciate you. And we say, see we meet next week. Enjoy your Easter weekend. And God bless you. Thank you.